Hello, my name is Dan Kramer, and I'm running for the U.S. House of Representatives in Tennessee's 7th Congressional District. I retired from the Army in 2012 after 26 years. I served in the United States Army in two wars in Iraq, spent most of that time here at Fort Campbell serving in the 101st. While in the Army, you don't raise your hand with problems unless you have the solutions to go with them. And nine times out of ten, that means you usually get volunteered to fix the problem as well. And that's what's brought me into politics now. We have a Congress that's the most unproductive in history, and for the first time in our nation's history, people are not convinced that their children will be doing better than they did themselves. We're coming out of a very long recession, but we should be doing a lot better than we are. And it's the inaction in Congress which is holding our country back. Congressman, when you look at uh, the ratings overall for, for your body, um, you, you know, there's the, you get low approval ratings. Why do you think that is and what can you do to improve them? Well, I think we get low approval ratings because people don't see things coming through. They don't see problems being solved. And what they see when they listen to the major media outlets and look at the nightly news is bicker, 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 petty, petty, petty. And they want our emphasis to be on jobs and the economy. and the long-term stability and freedom and uh, freedom, free people and free markets and what they hear is this, you know, bicker, bicker. I'm, I can understand. It's offensive to me too. All right, well, this is one of these instances where I actually agree with Congresswoman Blackburn. We have the least productive Congress we have ever had in the history of our country. Uh, and it is, it is appalling. Um, this is what's brought me into politics. This is, this is why when I got out of the Army and I saw the country's credit rating downgraded and the shutdowns going on over, over silly fights over a budget, uh, that Congress's job is to pass, um, that's what brought me into politics. So it's, it's time we moved on beyond a, a complete political game of trying to fix blame and let's fix problems. Uh, if we fix the problems, then we can have a big argument about who gets credit for that. Um, that I'm ha that's an argument I'm happy to have. But right now, uh, we're getting nowhere. And if we keep sending the same people to Congress over and over and over, how do we expect anything to change? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My amendment seeks to prohibit any taxpayer funds from being used by the Federal Communications Commission, the FCC, to preempt state municipal broadband laws. In other words, we don't need unelected federal agency bureaucrats in Washington telling our states what they can and can't do with respect to protecting their limited taxpayer dollars and private enterprises. As a former state senator from Tennessee, I strongly believe in states' rights. I know that's an issue that's important to many of my colleagues in this chamber. And that's why I found it deeply troubling that FCC Chairman Tom Wheeler has repeatedly stated this past year that he intends to preempt states' rights when it comes to the role of state policy over municipal broadband. Chairman Wheeler's statements pose a direct challenge on the constitutionality of states' sovereign functions. It wrongly assumes Washington knows what is best and forgets that the right answer doesn't always come from the top down. Mr. Chairman, 20 states across our country have held public debates and enacted laws that limit municipal broadband to varying degrees. These state legislatures and governors have not only listened, but have responded to the voices of their constituents. They are closer to the people than the chairman of the FCC. They are accountable to their voters. States have spoken and said we should be careful and deliberate in how we allow public entry into our vibrant communications marketplace, a sector of our economy that invests tens of billions of dollars each year, accounts for tens of thousands of jobs, and serves millions of consumers. This Congress cannot sit idly by and let an independent agency trample on our state's rights. This is an issue that should be left to our states, and if it comes to a point where we need a national standard, then that debate should be held by Congress, not the FCC, and should be done with the participation of the American people. I urge adoption, and I reserve the balance of my time. I, I think it's important to note that what this amendment does is to allow those citizens and those cities and those states 
that have made this decision. This is how they want to handle broadband to do it. It gives the power to them. It keeps bureaucrats sitting at the FCC from making these decisions and overriding the wishes of our states and of those cities that are located therein. I uh, urge adoption of the amendment and I yield back the balance of my time. The, uh, I think it's pretty obvious to everybody that the internet has become an important and essential piece of American industry, American society, uh, and part of our economy. The bill that Congresswoman Blackburn is talking about on the floor of the House would stop the FEC from allowing Chattanooga to expand its municipal broadband high-speed fiber optic cable uh, internet service uh, beyond where it is right now. Now there's a state law in Tennessee that says the municipalities cannot expand beyond their certain borders. And that law was written uh, at the bequest of the cable companies through their lobbyists uh, and through their state legislatures to keep cable companies and internet service providers to have a, a good monopoly on service in Tennessee. So when she says it's a state's rights issue, what she's really complaining about is it's the rights of the lobbyist who's written the state laws. Uh, in her own closing argument, she mentions that it's, uh, there needs to be freedom for the states and freedom for the municipalities. Well, in this case, Chattanooga, the municipality, needs that freedom to provide service to people who have no internet service. These are remote customers that no cable company will go near, and yet, as we understand, uh, basic life uh, today really requires internet access. Certainly, if you, uh, if, you have, if you need remote access to your bank, to your doctor, uh, I can't imagine trying to homeschool without internet access. So this is a, this is a big issue, and, and by taking the side of big corporations, I think Marsha Blackburn has shown uh, that the needs of the people of Tennessee really don't come first. Tell me about the tradition of the Second Amendment in Tennessee. Well, the tradition of the Second Amendment, what can you say? You know, I, I like to look at it as one of those issues that is always there and constant. People believe in the right to bear arms and to self-defense, and uh, it's always one of those issues that people will vote on that issue, right. which is great. Excellent. All right, well, you heard Diane Feinstein. Sure. Uh, uh, Ms. Blackburn, and you heard uh, Ray Kelly. Uh, what's your take on it? Uh, my take is, first of all, we need to make certain we keep children safe. And that's what we want to do. But I got to tell you, when I hear some of this conversation, I think that we're looking at symptoms. We're not looking at the root causes. And I've talked with a lot of teachers, classroom teachers, after the Sandy Hook situation. And they say, look, we need to be looking at mental health. We need to be looking at the root causes, some of these psychotropic drugs. And not let this be about the weapon, but let's talk about some of the root causes in these issues. And I, I understand the senator's passion for this but I got to tell you an assault ban is not the answer to helping keep people safe the Second Amendment is an important part of our country's culture of our history of the foundation of this Republic that's why it's the Second Amendment right after freedom of speech and freedom of religion and freedom of the press it's not just something that people are interested in vote about uh, now I don't support bans on particular types of weapons the assault weapons bans in general don't do any good. Uh, one, because they don't target the real problem, which most deaths are caused by handguns. Uh, and, and two, it's, it's an easy workaround. If you, if you ban one color of plastic, then people change to another. If you ban one shape of barrel, they just change to a different one. Uh, it's not the problem, the, the guns aren't the problem, it's the problem in our society with the people who shouldn't have weapons getting them. And that means background checks. Right now, our gun shows are or if you're a drug dealer or if you're a criminal and you need a gun in a hurry, that's where you go, is you go to a gun show because you know there's no background checks there. In the 21st century, there's no reason in the world why we can't have a reliable and safe system to check the background of anybody buying a weapon to make sure they legally can own it. And at the same time, we can also check to make sure the weapon isn't stolen. If I'm selling a weapon to somebody, I want to make sure I'm selling it to somebody who can legally own it. If I'm buying a weapon from somebody, I want to make sure I'm not buying stolen merchandise. Uh, I talked to the owner of Tennessee Gun Country in Clarksville, Tennessee, and they have the same opinion. They, they support background checks. We don't support gun registration, but background checks, that's, uh, that's common sense. That's responsible gun ownership.
remember my first job when I was working in a retail store uh, growing up down there in Laurel, Mississippi. I was making like $2.15 an hour, and I was being taught how to responsibly handle those customer interactions, and I appreciated that opportunity. Uh, well, here's another example where I actually agree with Congresswoman Blackburn. Uh, her minimum wage job of $2.15 uh, an hour, whatever it was, back in 69, 70, uh, in today's dollars, uh, works out to somewhere between $13 and $15 an hour. So yes, that's what people need to live on. You can't expect someone to work 40 hours a week, come home, and have the government subsidize their housing and their food and their, their, their health care. If you work 40 hours a week, you shouldn't live in poverty. And if you work 40 hours a week and the taxpayers are providing you what it takes to survive, then basically the taxpayers are paying a subsidy to your employer. That uh, they, that the Republicans claimed that um, the employer was going to punish the workers if they voted to unionize, that this was a new experiment in right-wing zealotry, that uh, there was despicable interference by Republicans, including the governor, Senator Corker, Republican state legislators, an aggressive anti-worker campaign, and politically motivated threats that led to this defeat for them. Well, what we have to realize is that the VW plant gave the union the opportunity to go on in and see their workers. The NLRB held the election. And you had the opposition that couldn't go into the plant. So I think that they're a little bit misstating it. So the deck was stacked to, against It was stacked, yes. And it was, well, no, it was stacked sorry, in, favor in favor of unionization. of unionization and against the opposition. But I think what we are seeing is that individuals, the worker wants to stand up for himself and they don't trust big unions, they don't trust big institutions. You can see it in how people distrust government. It's a trend. I don't understand why the Republican Party has a problem with labor unions. Labor unions represent working Americans. This is the voice working Americans have against uh, the large power that comes from the huge capital in large corporations. Uh, we live in a country that has checks and balances. The government has checks and balances within itself. But there needs to be, in the workplace, there needs to be a check and a balance on the power of the capital. And that check is the union, the labor union, the, the workers' ability to organize. Uh, Marshall Blackburn talks about workers want the freedom to operate individually. Well, that just means you're individually free to face a big corporation all by yourself. Uh, what individual has the resources to take on a Walmart or an Exxon or a GM? There isn't one, and that's, that's the role of the labor union. To say that people don't trust large organizations, they don't trust big government, uh, well, that's, that's party line. People like big government when it comes time to do big things, like disaster relief, or ensuring that workplaces are safe, or ensuring that we have clean air to breathe, and those kind of things. So there is a role for government. Uh, not every bit of government is big and intrusive. In fact, most parts of the government are there to help us and act as a check on people who would do whatever they wanted to if left without supervision. Now, one thing I want to point out, kind of telling, she mentioned that the UAW was allowed to go into the plant, but the opposition was not. Well, what would be the opposition to a union? There shouldn't be any opposition that should go there shouldn't be any way for opposition to go into a plant because the only people who can oppose the union are the workers. So she, she, she reveals in her hand right there in that outside forces in the Tennessee Republican Party, uh, in the Tennessee legislature, wanted to have outside influence into the UAW decision, the VW plant. There should be no opposition to a union except from the workers, and those should already be in the plant. There shouldn't be any reason to have outside opposition that can't have access to the workers. I think that we all agree that the soaring of horses in any form is an, it's objectionable on every level, and for good reason. Soaring is illegal. And you're going to hear from Commissioner Johnson, the state of Tennessee has zero tolerance for those who knowingly commit violations and have worked diligently with industry leaders to curb the practices. In fact, according to the most recent data from USDA, the compliance rate for shows this year has been over 96 percent, 
with less than 4% of the nearly 10,000 inspections resulted in some sort of SOAR violation. This legislation imposes excessive regulatory burdens on the walking horse industry and could potentially eliminate the entire industry and thus the entire breed. With that so I have, uh, I have some disagreements with uh, Congresswoman Blackburn here on the issue of the, of the SOAR horses in Tennessee. Uh, the first off, she says that uh, it's not a problem, and in fact it is. Uh, in the year uh, following those statements she made in, in the hearing there, in, at the celebration, the national celebration of walking horses, uh, 52 out of 52 horses uh, actually showed evidence of soaring chemicals on their, on their legs when the U.S. Department of Agriculture inspected them. Um, this year, uh, 2014, uh, it was more than half, more than half of the horses. Uh, that were in the big lick categories were showing evidence of soaring and abuse. So it's clear that the current system we have where there's an industry inspection group isn't working. The industry inspection group is inspecting the horses and passing them and then when the USDA look at them uh, finding that there's evidence of soaring and abuse. Congresswoman Blackburn is sponsoring a bill that competes with another one called the PAST Act. Now the PAST Act would end soaring of Tennessee walking horses. Uh, her bill would allow the industry to continue to regulate itself, but it's the 20-year legacy of the industry that has brought us soaring of Tennessee wagon horses to begin with. And her claim that if you remove soaring uh, and you remove stacks and chains that you'll destroy the breed uh, doesn't really stand up to logic. There's nothing about breeding a horse that uh, is involved in mechanically affecting their gait with, with stacked shoes or causing them pain on their forelegs with chemicals. If anything, uh, soaring and chains and stacks are weakening the breed because they're allowing horses that aren't bred to walk the, the way that we want Tennessee walking horses to walk uh, to perform better than they really should be able to. Then when they win prizes, those bloodlines carry on. So inferior breeds are really destroying the breed uh, and basically because of soaring. But um, that's, that's beside the point. It's a, basically an inhuman treatment of the horse. Uh, to, to have a horse live in pain for most of its life uh, simply so it can walk a certain way around a show ring twice a year uh, is, is just not acceptable or moral. That's what How about GRB pay equity is, laws yeah. to ensure that women are treated fairly in the workplace? I think that more important than that, it is making certain that women are recognized by those companies. You know, I've always said I wasn't, I, I didn't want it to be given a job because I was a female. I wanted it because I was the most well qualified person for the job. And making certain that companies are going to move forward in that vein, that is what women want. What about you? They don't want the decisions made in Washington. They want to be able to have the power and the control and the ability to make those jo decisions. Jonathan, themselves. isn't it interesting? Uh, let me ask you about this sure. uh, debate over equal will pay for women. Sure. Uh, there was a lot of uh, debate on, on that last <laughs> week. Finally, Republicans blocked it in the Senate. Uh, are Republicans against equal pay for women, and is that going to be a good political issue in these coming midterm elections? You know, I find this war on women rhetoric just almost silly. It is Republicans that have led the fight for women's equality. Go back through history and look at who was the first woman to ever vote, elected to office, go to Congress, but why four did, out of five why governors. But why did the uh, Senate Republicans well, then block this? Well, because the legislation was something that was going to be helpful for trial lawyers. And what we would like to see happen is equal opportunity and clearing up some of the problems that exist that are not fair to women. We're all for equal pay. I would love for women to be focused on maximum wage. And I have fought to be recognized with equality for a long time. A lot of us get tired of guys condescending to us. Congresswoman Blackburn's position, she says that the Republican Party has been the champion of women. Well, uh, if we go back before the Civil War and the age of suffragettes, sure, but we all know political parties are not what they were 150 years ago. Uh, if you look at today, if you look at Marsha Blackburn's voting record, she's voted against the Lilly Ledbetter uh, Act, which would allow women to uh, address grievances in the workplace if they haven't been paid equally. She voted against the Fair Paycheck Act. She voted against the Violence for Women Act. And again, Congresswoman Blackburn mentions that women want the power, they want the ability uh, to make these decisions in the workplace. 
Well, if those decisions and that empowerment isn't provided uh, by protection by law, then how, how are they supposed to get it? Uh, do, does she believe that Walmart will all of a sudden begin paying its women the same as men simply out of a sense of duty? Uh, no. And these, these law, there are laws in place to protect other groups in the workplace. Uh, and for some reason, women are not considered uh, an important enough group to be treated fairly in the workplace by the Republican Party. Need to do. I want to ask you about a vote that happened last week. Uh, the House passed the uh, Violence Against Women Act. Right. You were an original supporter of it. You put out Absolutely. a statement in May uh, in support of it, said you must continue to make every effort to ensure that funding is available to help right. these victims of violence. And then you voted against it. Why? Right, the final ver the Senate version. I voted for all of the House, the two House versions that we had, the what was wrong replacement with the amendment. Version? Yeah, and the Senate version. You know what you do is begin to dilute the money that needs to go into these uh, sexual assault centers, domestic abuse centers, our child advocacy centers. All of those I've helped to start here in my area in Tennessee. And when you start to make this about other things, and it, it becomes an again. The Violence Act and not a targeted, focused act that is there to address the issue of violence against women that Chuck for far too long. That is something that you couldn't talk about outside of a home or outside right. of a family. And with the advent of these shelters, we were able to bring this forward so what and part talk of the Senate about bill, it. What part of the Senate bill did you not like that, that diluted it? Is there a specific? Part, I, I didn't. I didn't like the uh, conscience, uh, the way the conscience protections were uh, there on the trafficking. I didn't like the way it was expanded uh, to include other different groups. Marsha Blackburn mentions that she didn't vote for the Violence Against Women Act because it included protections for groups that she didn't feel like protecting, uh, and she mentions that it included protections uh, for human trafficking and it also included other groups into the violence against women. Well, what she's basically saying is that uh, for some reason some women are entitled to protection from violence and others aren't, or that human trafficking is not a type of violence against women. And, and these, again, these, these go back to, I don't understand how you can consider yourself leading the fight uh, for equality for women in, in our culture and our society, and, and voting against things like the Violence for, Against Women Act. When you look at um, when you look at the Democrats, and you look at uh, the Julia meme, and you look at uh, the war on women, you being a woman in the Republican Party, do you feel there's a war on yourself? <laughs> well, I, I think it is just so hilarious that they the liberals keep trying to make it a war on women and they would talk about the GOP platform you know there's a war on women. I said are you kidding me this is almost laughable I'm a woman I helped to write this I co-chaired this committee do you think we would push for things that are not friendly to women and to families and to children for goodness sakes I mean it is just so absurd the thing that they keep missing is this they want everybody to believe in one little tiny cue and then stay on the same message. We believe in individual freedom. And people are going to do things differently. They're going to approach problems and issues differently. And we want the individuals to retain those skill sets that they're going to need. Right now, number one issue with women is jobs in the economy.